Thanks to AG1 for sponsoring today's video. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. Western history says that the Second World War began on September 1st, 1939 with the invasion of Poland by Nazi Germany. But the Republic of China had fought Imperial Japanese aggression for a full eight years before the first panzers rolled into Poland. And China would spend the war riven with internal strife even as they beat back the Japanese. In this video, we will look at the Second World War from the Chinese perspective, who fought for their very existence as a people. Imperial Japan first brought conflict to China with the 1931 invasion of Manchuria. But this conquest did not satiate their colonial ambitions, and the empire thus began rattling the metaphorical katana around Shanghai in 1932 before invading the Jehol province the following year. 1936 would see the Japanese and Nazi Germany sign the Anti-Comintern Pact, and Chinese dictator Chiang Kai-shek began courting German support for his internal struggle against the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, who were quickly winning the hearts and minds that his Chinese nationalist movement, or Kuomintang, could not. But ideological agreement did not bring peace, as the Japanese moved on the Soyuan province even as the Chinese and Germans traded anti-communist messages. Open war in China would break out following the Marco Polo Bridge incident in 1937, where Chinese and Japanese forces on the outskirts of Peking exchanged fire after Japanese troops crossed into Chinese territory in a naked provocation a full-scale invasion of the Republic of China ensued. Before we continue, I'd like to say a few words about our sponsor, AG1, a comprehensive daily nutritional drink made up of 75 high-quality, whole food-sourced ingredients, including vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, carefully created to nourish all of the body's systems holistically. AG1 fits in seamlessly as an essential healthy routine that helps you set your intentions and start each day on the right path. Running my own media company requires me to be at my best, and AG1 provides nutrients that support sustained physical and mental energy, as well as vital stress adaptogens, minerals, and vitamins that enhance focus, mental clarity, cognition, and alertness to help me multitask and manage ongoing video projects with ease, and improve attention to detail, all essential qualities in my line of work. Preparation is easy. All you need is one scoop or travel packet and eight ounces of water to make AG1, a sweet and smooth tasting, effortless daily habit. Go to athleticgreens.com slash the armchair historian to get started on your order. AG1 is going to give my community a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Thanks again to AG1 for sponsoring today's video. The Chinese were horribly outmatched. The Republic of China fielded expansive numbers of infantry with precious few tanks or artillery to support them, and scarcely a navy or air force. Journalist Du Zhongyuan chronicled the struggles of Chinese troops. Each day they only got one meal, because the supply transport corps were so often bombed by enemy aircraft. But what I felt saddest about was that when our side withdrew, a lot of our seriously wounded brothers had no one to look after them. Please tell me, what are we fighting for? Finding both their backs to the wall, the Kuomintang and CCP would put aside their differences to form the Second United Front. Mao Zedong himself declared, all political parties and groups in the United Front must help each other and make mutual concessions for the sake of long-term cooperation. 
but the newly christened War of Liberation against Japan would prove costly, and the United Chinese were driven into a desperate fighting retreat that lost the cities of Shanghai, Hangzhou, and Nanking, among others. The Japanese were brutal in their conquests, and Nanking in particular would devolve into a carnival of depravity as Japanese soldiers committed crimes against humanity, including the assault of Chinese women, slaughter of infants, and other horrors beyond comprehension. The Japanese campaign of atrocities in Nanking is well known, but the situation was grim even before Japanese forces breached the nationalist capital. Nanking was swollen with refugees, who competed with locals for what scarce resources were available. The situation became so dire that in the Nanking safety zone, food aid began to only be doled out for payment of a token fee though the poorest refugees were given red tags to mark them as in need of free food. Sanitation was non-existent, with waste littering the city and building up inside houses, with their soldiers marking up defeat after defeat and hope draining by the instant. The literal stench of war hung over Nanking. Zhu Qishang, a survivor who was 22 at the time, recounted the Japanese crimes. Soldiers came to round people up. After detaining us, the Japanese soldiers took the three of us to a riverside. The moment we reached the riverside, the other two were hacked to death with swords. One of them struck me with a sword at the back of my neck, causing me to fall to the ground instantly. Still conscious, I bit hard at the collar of the shabby overcoat I was wearing to hold my breath in order to feign being hacked to death. Besides the wholesale slaughter of general civilians, it is estimated that over 20,000 women were victimized by the Japanese within the first month after Nanking's fall. Obtaining an exact number is complicated by twin tragedies. Many women were killed following their assault, while still others remained silent about their ordeal until their last days. 20,000 men were executed on false charges of being Chinese soldiers, while 30,000 actual Chinese troops were executed after capture in flagrant violation of international law. But as the shattered, brutalized city of Nanking settled into the rhythms of occupation, in the Guangzhou newspaper, an article on April 1st, 1938 read, after occupying the government organizations, they spread out to conduct searches, wantonly slaughtering our civilians. Civilians with shaved heads or other resemblance to a soldier were tied up without exception. The situation appeared bleak, as regional warlord turned nationalist general Han Fuku ignored orders from central command and retreated from Jinan to preserve his forces. This led to the Japanese capturing of Qingdao in January 1938, resulting in Han's execution on January 24th by a now furious Chiang Kai-shek. With Japanese forces occupying the north of Shandong in March, the Yellow River defense line collapsed. Still, the Chinese put up a stubborn resistance, with reinforcements from Li Zongren's army managing to humiliate the Japanese in the Battle of Terzhuang. Meanwhile, Japanese atrocities had driven many Chinese into joining the fight, with the communists under Mao Zedong seeing a significant boost in volunteers for his Red Army, which grew from 50,000 to 500,000 over 1937 to 1938. By August, the Red Army were able to form the new 4th Army and 8th Route Army, which were incorporated into the second United Front commanded by Chiang Kai-shek. But Japanese victories in 1938 saw the Chinese pushed to their limits, resulting in a desperate scorched earth maneuver infamously known as the Yellow River Floods. In June 1938, nationalist saboteurs intentionally destroyed the Yellow River dikes in order to slow down the Japanese invasion. The resulting floodwaters displaced millions of people and caused massive destruction of homes, crops, and infrastructure. Tens of thousands of people died as a result of the floods, and the economic impact was felt for years to come. 
The flood also had significant military consequences, as it slowed down the Japanese advance and enabled the Chinese forces to regroup and strengthen their defenses. Ultimately, however, it only held off the Japanese for a time, as they eventually captured the cities Amoy, Fuchao, Kaifeng, and Wuhan by the time nationalist forces had retreated to Chongqing in November. Prompted by Japanese brutalities, U.S. President Roosevelt gave the Chinese a liberty loan of $25 million to help with recovery efforts. British Burma also became a Chinese supply depot, with the legendary Burma Road providing overland transport of desperately needed supplies and materiel. Chiang Kai-shek accepted foreign support with suspicion, and sought to exploit his Western backers for his own ends. Despite their stance against Japanese aggression, the Kuomintang was far from a model of decency, and throughout the war, nationalist officials were notorious for embezzlement, ineptitude, and outright corruption. Deficits that would drive the Chinese people into the open arms of Mao Zedong. 1939 would see the Chinese continue to lose territory, and in 1940, the Japanese consolidated their gains into a puppet state under ultra-conservative and anti-communist Wang Jingwei, who began pressuring the British to close the Burma Road. That same year, the U.S. applied soft pressure to the Japanese, embarking on limited iron and fuel embargoes that made their support of Chiang's Republic inescapably clear. But as it gained support from without, the Republic found itself facing an old enemy within. The Second United Front was an uneasy alliance, and the CCP grew increasingly impatient with having to take orders from the Kuomintang, who were aggravated in turn by highly successful CCP recruiting efforts in free China. Chang's goal was to unite the people together under his flag alone. 1941 would see the Second United Front collapse as the Communist New Fourth Army fought Kuomintang troops in what both sides claimed to be a traitorous ambush of their forces by the other side. Regardless of who ambushed whom, 1941 would also see the Chinese begin to retake territory and turn the Japanese back in a defensive victory at the Second Battle of Changsha. The empire was dealt another blow when the US, Netherlands, and Britain ended their trade in oil, cutting Japan off from the world oil market. Enraged and economically cornered, the Japanese expanded their war of aggression, bombing Pearl Harbor and launching their East Asian Blitzkrieg. The Sino-Japanese War was now truly part of the Second World War. January 1942 saw the Japanese finally succeed in conquering Changsha, and the Chinese defense became a scorched earth one. As the Kuomintang and CCP withdrew, they burned bridges and stripped factories, with many workers carrying off equipment in hopes of setting up shop in free China. Some Chinese troops withdrew to British India, while others moved to reinforce defensive positions elsewhere in the country. The Japanese would end the year capturing the city of Leisho, which cut the Burma Road definitively. Japan's attack on the United States and invasion of East Asia topped off a major crisis within the Chinese resistance. Despite the resistance once again fracturing along party lines, both nationalist and communist forces continued to engage in frontline actions, guerrilla warfare, sabotage, and propaganda campaigns against the Japanese invaders. Kuomintang leadership attempted to resupply and reorganize troops with the help of American and British allies, although corruption within the nationalist upper circles led to friction with the West. American funds that had been intended for use against Japan were instead directed toward fighting communist forces who were gaining influence throughout southern China thanks to the guerrilla efforts of the rebuilt New Fourth Army under Commander Chen Yi. 
As 1943 dawned, the nationalists began rebuilding their forces in India, but not without struggle. 60 to 70 percent of inductees did not finish basic training, with the majority deserting, while a full 20 percent starved to death behind Allied lines. Over 100 million dollars in materiel and aid given to them by the U.S. was siphoned off to prepare for an eventual conflict with the CCP after the war. Despite their travails, four divisions were successfully reformed in India and flown back to China, where 16,000 Chinese defeated 60,000 Japanese at the Battle of Changde in the Hunan province. Progress was also made in Burma, with Chinese forces advancing in North Burma in late 1943 to besiege Japanese troops in Mayakina. 1944 would see Chang lobby for a joint offensive to reopen the Burma Road, growing tired of the need to fly in troops to India for every resupply effort. As Allied engineers pushed to build new supply lines across friendly territory, Chang's forces achieved numerous victories, such as the capture of Mount Song in Burma around June 1944. However, efforts to reopen the Burma route were severely hampered by the launch of Operation Ichigo, a Japanese offensive designed to conclude the Chinese theater once and for all. As the Japanese continued to press Ichigo, the Chinese joined the multinational Burma campaign, an epic series of battles and sieges that ended with the country liberated and the Burma road open once more. The fighting in Burma would carry China through the end of the war and the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Japan surrendered as the Soviets invaded Manchuria, but the guns did not fall silent in the Middle Kingdom. The corpse of Japanese imperialism was hardly cold before the Kuomintang and CCP were once again at each other's throats. China was devastated by prolonged war, with infrastructure ruined political division at an all-time high, and millions of refugees left without homes. Figures vary wildly on the total number of Chinese troops and civilians who lost their lives from 1937 to 1945, but all agree that the figure lies in the tens of millions. Tragically, however, the Chinese Civil War was yet to be resolved. <laughs> 